there are two or three operas that are perfect. La Traviata is a perfect opera because it is an absolutely intimate story, effective of only three people. There's Violetta herself, Lady of the Camellias, there's her lover, Alfredo, and there's his father, uh, Padre Germont. And all the emotional plot is conducted between these three, which means you, can, you have extremely uh, intimate and domestic scenes between the people, which feels very much like a play. It's based on a, a play written by Alexandre Dumas Jr. Um, and then it expands to have the big scenes that opera can provide where the whole stage is full. Here we work on a, a very reduced chorus, so the small solo parts also sing the chorus. And so it goes every scale from the biggest, it has a, a, a kind of Espanol entertainment, which we have just as an orchestral interlude. It has the big tragic scenes. It has the love duet just between the two people. It has her showcase aria. So it goes through almost um, a, a perfect recitation of mid 19th century opera form. But it does it with an incredible tenderness, which is what Verdi had. Um, the piece is based on a novel that was then made into a play. The novel itself was not so successful, The Lady of the Camellias, but when he made it into a play, it became rather a success because it took two years to get past the censors. So by the time it got to the stage, its scandalous nature was already well documented and people couldn't wait to see it. And so those two plays are not as tender as Verdi is. Alexandre Dumas was the illegitimate son of the first Dumas who wrote Three Musketeers who was a legendary man about town, let's call it that politely. Um, and so not only was he an illegitimate son, but as and when he, he reconnected with his father, it was his father and a series of rather celebrated mistresses and rather public love affairs. And Alexandre Dumas, the son, had a slightly prissy reaction against this. But just before that happened, he had his one great love, which was Marie Duplessis who was the Lady of the Camellias. And that he kind of captured in all the, the intensity of youth before he became a slightly tutting and moralizing middle-aged man. Verdi brings the father's aspect to it because Verdi lost two children in very early life, two daughters. And he loves his fathers and especially the father of daughters deeply in his operas, and that's the extra tenderness that Verdi brings to it is absolutely from the character of the father. What I've been able to do to at this time is to jettison, in many ways, the cliched expectation, which is big crinolines and a very, very glamorous affair and a very, very elegant death, which is rather to betray the brutality of the world of, of the 1840s, it was, in fact, that that Marie Duplessis herself, who died of consumption, lived through. It was a venal and it was a mercenary world. The censors who censored the play were then replaced by the Italian censors who also censored the opera. And so a lot of the allusions to Violetta's profession, which is politely called courtesan, but is absolutely a lady who sleeps with men for money, um, is done in code. So there are references, but then absolutely not allowed to dot I's and cross T's. And in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, people had turned it into a kind of a rather sugary love story, where she dies at the end, so we, have, we get to weep. But it's the story of a victim, and Marie is treated as if she has been completely betrayed by society. But uh, it's absolutely not the case. She is what she is, she knows what she is. And the demand made of her to give up her lover by the father is in no way an unreasonable one in the circumstances. He has a daughter who wishes to get married. They live in Provence, it's a provincial life. And her fiancé, should there be a whiff of scandal of her brother being en ménage with a Parisian prostitute, that marriage would never happen. And the father asks for uh, a gift, if you like, for his daughter, not for his son and not for his own puritanical uh, needs, which is often the way it's played now, is that the father is a kind of black-clad avenger who unreasonably and viciously destroys Violetta. It's actually not the case. Even in the scene in which he says, this is the situation, and 
I'm going to ask you for the sacrifice. She says, you are entitled to ask for the sacrifice. It is true what you say. I can never marry Alfredo. Our connection can never be sanctified by the bonds of holy matrimony. And therefore, given that, given my past, I understand why you ask this, and I give it to you not exactly freely, because she suffers horribly when she does it, but she gives it to him as a, a demand that he is entitled to make. And that, I think, has very much been lost over the years, that she is absolutely, in the kind of post-Freudian world, nothing but a victim. And that's to betray many things, because she was a woman in a certain milieu, which was a heartless one. And she herself was rather famous. Marie Duplessis, the model of the character, was famous for being rather heartless. Not in the sense that she was cruel, but in the sense that she moved through her succession of lovers with little compunction and uh, with an eye to the main chance, because it was her job. And so we've put it back into a much less glamorous Second Empire world. It's not nearly as rich on stage. But we have, we've moved the action forward to the turn of the century, turn of the 20th century. And we've put it into a world that's a little bit more bohemian and a little bit more varied in tone than everybody in crinolines and white ties and, you know, always sitting with their legs carefully crossed. Because if you read the original story and the play, that is absolutely not the world that it comes from. The cultural experience has been enormously positive, um, partly because I have a young cast and I love working with young singers before they've had the chance to kind of ossify in their own uh, comfort zones. So you can ask them to do almost anything you like. It's an incredibly intensive rehearsal period. So there's five days from first rehearsal to the orchestra coming in and my job being effectively over because I have to hand over the conductor. And very, very many directors would find that an absolute horror because a lengthy process is, you know, the, the way that we've now got used to doing it. In some ways, when you have only the five days, you have no choice but to have the right idea straight away. So it's a great challenge. But it's also, uh, I like to work against boundaries. So if somebody said to me, you can come and do anything you like, I would, ha I would have 25 ideas and couldn't choose. When they say you've got five days, you've got this cast, you've got a budget of pocket money, and it will have to work that way, that's how it has to work. I love to work that way, so Clonto is great for that because everybody's here on site, and you can really, even when they're sitting upstairs while you're rehearsing down here, it's still developing because they've only just finished talking to you, they go up there and they're gonna come back to you in 20 minutes time to do a whole new scene. And so it developed very, very quickly. I, been very lucky in that all my cast are, are very efficient and good catalogues of their material and so we haven't had to revise material in, in that awful way we go do we all remember what we did last time and then there's a kind of terrible committee meeting that's not happened